2024 Cubs convention is brought to you by Toyota, official vehicle of the Chicago Cubs. Prevagen. Prevagen is the number one pharmacist recommended memory support brand. Blue Cross Blue Shield. Through it all. The Bob LaCursio Auto Group. You're going to like buying a car this way. Benny's Beverage Depot. If you can't find it at Benny's, it's probably not worth drinking. Northwestern Medicine. When it comes to your health, a second opinion is always a good idea. Get yours at Northwestern Medicine. Hitting, it is a job eight days a week, and uh, these next four cats alongside Ron Coomer, and they are all professionals. So uh, let's talk in the batter's box with a quintet of sticks. We're going at the plate. Coom, what's up, man? How are we doing, Cole? And welcome, everybody, to the Cubs convention. And you guys have all been to the convention once before, right? Everybody? Michael, no? Okay. First so. timer. First timer, and you're the guy from Chicago, right? How's everybody doing out here at the Cubs convention? This is one of the. Do we know everybody on stage? I don't think I need to introduce anybody, right? Everybody, we got the heart of the lineup. We've got guys up the middle. We've got center field, third bay. I mean, you know, it's pretty good. We're going to have a little baseball hitting conversation. And the way it's going to go, we've got some microphones around the room, and we're going to get some questions. I'm Ron Coomer. I am the partner of the Hall of Famer, Pat Hughes. That's how I got to introduce myself now that he's in the Hall of Fame. Um, but we're going to have a hitting conversation, and once we open it up to everybody out on the floor, you can ask kind of what you want. If hitting isn't your thing and you want to know more personal, that's up to them. Uh, we'll start with that. But first of all, guys, welcome back to Chicago for the guys that haven't been here. And uh, my first question, Dan, and for all you guys can answer, what do you think of the Cubs convention, first of all? This is, you know, growing up as a Cub fan here and coming here as a free agent, I heard about it, but I didn't know about it. And then you're like, wow, this is a lot. I mean, it's definitely one of those things where you experience Wrigley when you're playing somewhere else. And you say it just feels different there, right? And then once you actually experience it for yourself, like we are, you know, um, you know, for me, my first one was last off season, and then this Cubs Con, it just it just shows the dedication, the loyalty, the support uh, that this fan base has for us, and uh, I don't think there's any better fan base in the world. Nikki, you've been on both sides of town. Yep, I've uh, I've I'm been not putting you on the spot or no, anything. I've, I'm putting I've, you on the spot. I've been to uh, other conventions on the other side of town, and uh, <laughs> this is on a whole nother level, and uh, I was looking forward to it this year, and last year was amazing, so uh, it's one of the things I've been looking forward to. Yeah, I mean, it's great when, you know, we're all working hard all off season, and uh, it's just a nice reminder of, you know, why we really do it, and cool to see all of you guys in the middle of winter, and appreciate the support always. Michael? I mean, it snowed a foot yesterday, and... Yeah. Place was packed, so best fans in baseball, man. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is going to be a hitting conversation. It's, you know, that's my favorite part of our game. You know, I always thought pitchers were out there just so we could play, right? So uh, I make big friends with some of the guys that I played with. But uh, for you guys right now, this is one of those times, you know, we're about a month out before you guys report to spring training. We were just having a conversation a little bit backstage about the preparation going into a season and the hitting part because we do it so much. How much of that have you done so far? Or is it one of those things where you kind of build up to get to camp and then, you know, you get five weeks? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is um, I start a little bit earlier than I typically do this year. I started a little bit before Christmas. And a lot of it is, you know, twice a week, maybe three times a week just to – get the calluses yep. back on your hands, kind of open the blisters back yeah. up so you can toughen them up. Uh, realistically, just trying to get your body in a position to be healthy going into camp and to stay healthy in camp. Um, and then as January comes and towards February before spring, you really start trying to hone in on, you know, some different skills or some things that you want to, um, yeah. Have you already a got the blood blister. Yeah. yeah. Blood blister. Um, All right. You really start honing in on some things that yep. you want to kind of build upon for the season. Guys, anybody else want to answer that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing I've learned from year to year is uh, I've started hitting later and later. And uh, I mean, talking to some of the veteran guys, they had always told me, I, I thought they were crazy, but some guys only hit 
you know, two weeks before spring training, and I thought that was crazy. Um, when I first got drafted, I mean, before Thanksgiving, I was hitting, but this year I, I started hitting a little bit later and uh, just focused on strength first and then hit a little bit later, and I feel amazing right now. And, uh, yeah, just one of the things I've learned over the years, so I'm hitting a little bit later. I think I'm on week three or four now, but um, like Dansby said, just kind of progressing off the tee to flips to machine, and, uh, yeah, but everything's feeling great right now. Now, do you guys kind of go the same thing? Or do you guys like to hit a little more than that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's there's there is every off season is its own thing, and you you learn uh, year by year what works best for you, and learn from your teammates as well. And um, yeah, I think I've pushed it back later as as years have gone on, but I like to think I'm doing it with a little better purpose and idea of what I'm doing, but always picking up new things as well. It is amazing, right? As we grow in our game as a player, and you come out of college, and for every guy that plays in the big leagues we could all rake in college, and we were all dominating college baseball. And then as you advance up, you start seeing different, maybe veteran guys, programs. You know, I heard the pitching guys talking earlier and guys looking at Kyle, and I remember talking to J.D. about, you know, Mike Scott and guys that were in the league that were really good when he was breaking in. And I had the same thing. I had Carlton Fisk on the other side of town working with me, and he was the one I was hitting, hitting, hitting. He's like, easy, you can hit. It's going to be okay. We'll, we'll figure it out. It's season gone. But it is something. Michael, when you, when you went home this year and you are ready to get things started and you start evaluating the offensive side of your game, when you start this process now, what goes through your mind? Um, I, I think that when, when you... After every single season, you're always looking for an edge, right? Yep. And you're always looking for ways to improve. And there, there's a fine balance between attacking things that you perceive as weaknesses as well as continuing to feed positive inputs towards your strengths because your strengths are going to be your bread and butter. And, uh, yeah, I would like to improve this a little bit here or a little bit here. Um, and with that being said, like, there's not, a, there's not a good big leaguer in the world that isn't an elite self-evaluator. Right. You got to be able to look in the mirror and say, hey, this didn't go well. But also it's like, well, this didn't go well because I was really good here. And it's like, well, you can't always have both. You got to give something up. Hitting's the hardest thing to do in sports. Um, but just being able to really look in the mirror and be okay with, hey, I wasn't very good at this. And I'm not going to try to like, well, hide from it. I'm not going to pretend that I wasn't. And acknowledging it lets you grow from it. I think allows you to grow from it. So um, you're always feeding your strengths, and you just try to clean up, you know, some of those areas for improvement a little bit here and there. Anything specific for any one of you guys that you're? Yeah, it's, it's go... well said. I mean, yeah, it's like that. Uh, right yeah. You know, we all, every single one of us, has things that we dominate, and then have things that we don't right. do as well. And I've definitely seen players and done it myself where you're so focused on what you can improve on it comes from a good place but you end up losing sight of of what you've always done well your whole life to get you there so it's always a fine balance it's an easy rabbit hole to go down right like no doubt we have so many numbers i don't think you guys even like understand oh. how many different things you can find if you want to go searching as and a broadcast it gives me a headache yeah i mean you sit there and you're like <laughs> you can start going like okay well why did i hit righties better than lefties this season okay why did i do better last season with two strikes compared to this year, and then, hmm, one one two one oh one. Those counts. I was hitting three forty. What yeah. what was I doing then? And you start really driving yourself crazy, and then in, bef instead of being able to say like, you know, things change from year to year. You get pitched differently year to year. What worked last year may not work this year. New team, and new team, new, team, new atmosphere. Lineup, yeah. So the ballpark, there's right? so many there's so many yeah. factors that go into, mm -hmm. it, and I think that sometimes you just got to take them with a grain of salt. Question for you, Nikki. You're in a situation, you and Michael, where you're not always playing every day like these two guys. And I know with me, as, as I get older and I played, I was more of a platoon guy. That is even, makes it even tougher to be a consistent hitter. When you have that situation for both of you guys, different mindset during the season as opposed to, you know, the other times when you guys were both playing every day? I mean, I, th I think, you know, getting ready for the season is the same, but, like, from preparation from day to day and getting ready for the game and 
scouting reports, and um, it, it is a bit different. That's one of the first times I've ever pinched hit this year. So it was something <laughs> completely new to me, you know. So, uh, you know, I talked to some friends that had done it. and um, Swing you, early, fastball, hit and, it. And, and that's what I learned. You know, you face some of these bullpen arms. I mean, they got some of the best stuff in the game. You really can't. Sometimes you can feel out starting starting pitchers, you know, take a pitch, and uh, I mean it depends on the guy, but um, you know, hitting late in the game, usually in a big spot, um, you got to be ready to go. You don't have time to warm up in the box. You know, you got to be hot and figure out your routine. You got to you know drink coffee or candy or whatever you got to do to get you know locked in for that at bat. But um, it's something I was kind of learning on the fly this year. So do they ship in the candy for the? I mean, there's, I there's candy that, buckets right? around there. There's anything you need. Uh, you I've seen around. a lot of salmon in the chicken breasts. I didn't know that we had the candy bucket. <laughs> That's my era, not yours. <laughs> so as you guys are going into this offseason, um, do you stay at home now that the facilities are so nice that all the teams have in the Cubs? You guys end up going to Phoenix a little earlier and, and end up in Mesa? to work out or are you still staying at home and doing a lot of your stuff still at home? We've kind of had a widespread on our team. We've had more guys in Chicago this year uh, than in past years. So there's gonna been a group of four or five guys that have been around here and then uh, a lot of guys in Arizona. So both those facilities are used really well and our staff is awesome through the whole off season. Even staff that isn't like required to work that time of year, they're putting in a lot of hours behind the scenes. So that helps us a lot. So we are going to start taking questions here in just a minute. I, I see there's guys lined up there. There's a microphone over here. Okay, so we will we'll take a question here in one second. I see a little guy over there. That's all right. Anything else when, you, when the season ends, to me, that's always the, the one thing. The season ends and the evaluation process, to me, is very different now because I hear about exit meetings and all of that. We never really did that. That was a... a I'll sit in the dugout for two minutes. You'd get a, you know, be be ready to hit next. You'd be ready to play. You're going to do this next year, and then that was it. Exit meetings because there's strategy to it of what they what's expected of you for the following year. What's ex, you know, in preparation. What is that like? Because that's something I never was a part of as a player. Anyone? Um, I can. I- take a shot at answering that one um you know it kind of leads back to that whole self-evaluation thing and um you know it takes a lot a lot of times my experience with exit meetings it's it's been a little bit I don't want to use the word like redundant but it's like when the season's over you're already thinking about okay, this is kind of how it went good or bad I need to do this I need to do this I need to do this and when it lines up it's great you know, when it lines up with what with the feedback that you're getting, it's like okay, like, hey, my, I'm, a, I'm on, I'm thinking about the right things, right. Um, and sometimes you hear something that it's like, man, I haven't even considered that, you know. But so, so it all depends. Um, but you know, everybody, every everything that's said to you, you kind of try to just take at face value, and it's like trying to be better. So you want you want to be open to everything, and you want to be better. And then the tough part as a ball player is this is what I need, this is what I have to do, and this is how I'm going to do it. Okay. I think, uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of those meetings too try and turn more towards like away from what did I do well, and more towards what. Can, sorry, I'm getting choked up. Um, <laughs> what is we can, serious? I just what, I just love we, talking about this team so yeah, much, man. I, yeah. I, <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting teary. We're get, getting a little early. About what can we do better, right? Like, what can yeah. we do better as a group? Um, where did we kind of stumble this year? Because at the end of the day, individual performance is great, and there's, yeah. you know, you have to perform as an individual for the team to be good. But if individuals are performing well and the team's not, then you got a real problem. And so you start understanding how we can construct things better or what we can put more emphasis on. And I feel like that that's kind of, at least in – you know, my experience with the meeting, especially here um, this past off season, it was all based around, like, what can we do better? What can we do more of, less of, to be able to win more games? Well, and the great thing about that, and where you came from before you became a Cub, you were in an extreme winning environment. And I can speak for all of us, too. Winning fixes a lot of things. And when you're winning, life is good for the whole group. 
Okay, we'll start, ask, start getting some questions. I know we're going to get some of these. I didn't want to ask too many hitting questions because I like when the kids ask some of these to see what they... Can you wave? Yep, you're up, dude. What's your name? Introduce yourself and then say who you want to ask the question to. All right? My name is Parker, and um, I just want to shout out to Nick Madrigal for the little guys. <laughs> yes! And uh, I also have a question for all of you guys. What does it feel like to get hit by a 95 miles per hour fastball t- in the back? It does not feel good, buddy. Does, especially in the Chicago weather. But, um, yeah. You stay right there. You come on up here for a second. Anybody get drilled really bad by somebody that, you know, like a bad one? I've got one real bad one. Clemens, What's, right in the middle of the back. Was it, was it on purpose? Oh, it blinked at me at first base. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that'd be, yeah. Yeah, I think we got less of that now. Come here. Same number too, it feels better with two strikes when you're on the verge yeah, of no doubt. who knows what when you're here. on base. Come on, Parker. One for the little guys. How about Parker, what's guys? Up, what's up? That's all right. What position you play, Parker? Um, I play second here, 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 catcher. Here. Say? I play second and catcher. Nice. Wow. And I bet you're a good hitter. Yeah. Right, righty, or, righty or lefty? Way to go. How about it for Parker? Righty or lefty? Righty or lefty? Righty or righty? Righty. Nice job, Parker. <laughs> we got somebody on our right. Give a wave. Oh, there you go. Okay. What's your name? And what's your question? Who are you asking? Hi, my name's Jerry. Uh, it's from oh. Mike Talkman. First of all, great catch. <laughs> great catch. Um, just want to know what the impact you have uh, from your high school coaches at Fremd High School. Um, the Fremd family out there is behind you 100%. And the local guy, too, right? I go, yeah, played ba- high school baseball right here in Illinois. Hmm? <laughs> What's up? Anybody want to answer the question? Uh, you, you asked about my coaches at Fremd? Yeah, what the impact was on you uh, from your high school coaches? Um... I mean, it was great, you know, like um, I got the opportunity, uh, you know, it's, it's always that was like kind of the first time I ever like really like tried out for a team. And it was like, uh, like, you know, nervous. Um, but, you know, high school baseball in Illinois is kind of one day you could be playing and it's snowing because it's 40 degrees outside. And the next day it's 75 degrees outside and you're, you know, running through the slush and just trying to make it happen. But, um, you know, high school was a great opportunity because uh, our coach was very, very uh, cooperative with the uh, different things we had going on. Um, I know, obviously, sports specialization is like a huge thing right now. But when I was in high school, I played multiple sports. And, and that, that kind of took me all over the place in the summertime. So just the flexibility there to, you know, um, kind of do the things that I needed to do. But, uh, also, the opportunity that I got, I got the opportunity to play on the varsity team when I was a freshman. And, the, you know, that, so that was me playing. I never played with guys two, three years older than me. Um, so that was, uh, you know, huge for kind of the maturing process and just, you know, getting to know a bunch of – playing with a bunch of people that I never played with because as my career is gone, it's like, you know, I've played on a lot of different teams and I've had to meet a lot of new people and I've had to integrate myself into a lot of different clubhouses and um, – you know, so that was that was some things that I didn't know it at the time, but you know, some some things that helped me, you know, later on. Anybody got a high school coach or somebody in their, when they were younger that really impacted their career? I would say for me, just the coach I ended up playing for when I was 17 and 18 for summer ball was probably the first coach that truly believed that I could be something yeah. and like really like the power of belief and instilling that in to me really kind of just helped my career unfold the way it was supposed to. I would never have gone to Vanderbilt without him. I probably wouldn't have really gone to any major school whatsoever. And uh, just his impact uh, was really awesome for me and uh, still do a bunch of hitting stuff with him in the off season. So yeah, that's great. Question. Um, Hi, my name is Ryan. Hi Ryan. And um, I have a question for everybody. Um, 
Who on your team supports you the most at hitting and why? I mean, we, we have a staff of hitting coaches. So we have a head hitting coach and then two assistants. That's kind of the setup. But honestly, your teammates is usually who uh, a lot of the best conversations are with. And whether it's guys that are older than you who face the same pitcher or, you know, teammates that you came up in the minor leagues with, like those are often the people that know you best. And um, it's awesome when you have a conversation with a teammate and then you go and see them do what they're working on. And that's really some of the cool stuff over a long season. Yeah, I, I was just going to kind of say this similar thing. You know, I, I think that's what's special about our team. It doesn't matter if it's a, you know, like a guy that's been in the league for eight years, or if it's a rookie, you know, you, you, there's a lot of conversations had during batting practice in the clubhouse. Um, you know, there's teammates watching each other's swings, you know, there's just so many conversations. And I think that's what makes a great team is when guys are sharing different knowledge. And I mean, the hitting coach might not always see what someone sees in the box, you know. So I think uh, at least last year that, that was great to see guys just really talking about different pitchers and scouting reports and uh, pretty special. As I get older as a player, the hitting coach for me was the guy um, I wanted to use his eyes to watch me in the box because I, was a, I hit with a lot of feel in my setup. Same thing with you guys where you, you'll bounce and I... I feel this. What are you seeing? Is that conversation yeah. you might have with the dugout quickly in game, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, I think that uh, something that that um, is maybe a little bit underrated is not only talking to your teammates, but finding out how they talk, right? Yeah. yeah. Like uh, you know, I've I've had you know a number of teammates. Everybody everybody perceives hitting differently. Everybody perceives things differently. But like, if I could, you know, like last year, if I could figure out especially, um, you know, being a left-handed hitter, if I, could, if I could figure out what Ian Happ is seeing and if I could figure out what Cody Bellinger is seeing and what they're looking for and they're advanced and all, and all that stuff, it's like, okay, now can, how can I – does that help me going into my next at-bat to see that maybe the shape of a breaking ball or, you know, what, what, what the fastball feels like, um, how he's attacking – different guys because I mean a lot of pitchers now it's it's they're trying to go into the game running their a plan and they're hoping that they never have to do anything else so as a team if we can take that a plan away from both the left and the yeah, right, right side it's like some guys won't know what to do yeah so it's like the, the better that communication gets in the dugout pre-game and during game it, it just benefits the, the offense as a whole yep. I like it Question? Yes, my question is for all five of you up on the stage. Was there ever... I'm just the broadcaster now, man. <laughs> I can't hit anymore. <laughs> was there ever a pitcher where you were like, oh, no, I have to face him? Um, like, yes. Usually people I'm... ask, who do you not want to face? Okay. And I definitely got that list. <laughs> well, I was mainly thinking like Mariano Rivera and his cutter. Like nobody wanted to see that. Was there anybody that you were just like... I'm beyond nervous to face. See, now, whoever. Mariano was okay to hit if you were right-handed. If you were left-handed, not so much. Anybody in the league that you go, this is good. Randy Johnson was one of them and Pedro when I was playing. You know, Roger threw the ball over the plate unless he was hot and then watch out. But he threw the ball over the plate. Randy Johnson, you know, he was 100 and didn't know where the hell it was going. I think <laughs> more than any one guy, I think now with as much just velocity as there is in the game and, you know, guys getting called up that, you know, you've never heard of, but they're throwing 100 and there's not really a scouting report a lot of the time. And, like, it's kind of a just go see what happens kind of situation. Like, yeah. those can be a little, a little sketchy, yeah. No offense, but I laugh at you guys in the booth. I'm like, Pat, this is going to be a comfortable life. Yeah. Well, you like, see somebody <laughs> warming up and they're throwing 100 and they're looking this yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, uh, you just hear the bullpen wall. Yeah. Right, exactly. I mean, it is a real thing. Sometimes you just go up there and say, I'm just going to take, and I guarantee you he throws four balls before he throws three strikes. So I just go up there, and I'm never going to swing, and it has worked plenty of times. My first at bat it against has. Randy Johnson. I didn't even think of swing. There's been a guy <laughs> he that threw I've... a pitch right here, and it hit the catcher's glove. Dan Wilson, who's from kind of where you're from, close. And it hit the glove, and I thought it was going to hit me. And I went, oh! And I'm like, it didn't hit me. I'm alive. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> I, don't I don't like playing against, like, 
catchers that I've played with more than like pitchers because it's like I've talked hitting with all yeah, these guys yeah, yeah. for like all this time and now they're behind the plate and it's like are they thinking that I know what they're thinking or are they thinking that I know what they're thinking what they're thinking so they're not going to do what I'm thinking and then I have to do what they're not thinking yeah. and it's like and now you get Don't like think just hit remember that? <laughs> and now you get like six seconds to get ready to hit yeah, yeah. so it's like which maybe is better. So you go just to kinda... John Maley with that early yeah. in the season. See what yeah. you get from males. That'll be entertaining. Question to the right. Wave so we can see you. There we go. What's your name? I'm Benson from Arlington Heights, and I have a question for Mike Talkman. Do you practice batting in Arlington Heights, and where do you practice? Oh. <laughs> And what's your address? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and are you available to give lessons? <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I, would. I I can't really practice in Arlington Heights right now. I'd be, you know, knee-deep in snow. But um, I have a few spots in the suburbs. Um, when, I, when I was a younger player, I trained out in a place, actually, in Mount Prospect, so just one town over. But, um, you know, uh, being here, it's really nice because I can get down to Wrigley a couple times a week, especially... Uh, you know, all my commuters know that i 90s open back up a little bit, so it's a little bit better now. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm around Arlington Heights sometimes. I'm more, I'm more focused on the coffee shops in Arlington Heights than the, uh, you know, the baseball spots. Guys? Places you work out at? You guys? Um, yeah, I'm at home in Atlanta. So. In Atlanta, so you, yep. you can be outside most yep. of the year. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, yeah, I know. too, He's... yep. Oh, I, I, don't hit, I don't do nothing outside. You kidding me? <laughs> You kidding me? How many, how many ground balls do you think our shortstop has taken so far this year? <laughs> Good answer. Zero. Do you think he needs to take any so far? <laughs> Here, I'll answer as a fellow infielder. No, he does not. <laughs> I think he's all good, all of them. Yep. All right, here we go. Question. I'm Nick Benitez, and I'm wondering what do you guys do like to get out of a slump when you're in one? Good question. There we go. I mean, sometimes it's uh, it's anything from changing your batting gloves, changing your bat, to doing a different routine. Um, you know, I think uh, especially over a long year, you know, you're going to have some rough stretches. You know, I don't think there's anyone, you know, that stayed hot the whole year, you know. So I think it for, it, for me personally, when I'm in a slump, it's more mental than anything. You know, it's very rare is, you know, my swing's completely different. Um, it's usually I'm overthinking something. I'm my best when I keep it simple. I'm just seeing the ball and hitting the ball. So um, for me personally, I, I like to switch it up, my batting gloves or anything like that. I think when you're uh, in a slump, the first thing you got to realize as a hitter is kind of what Talk was talking about was um, – just self-evaluating and like, am I actually performing differently, or am I not just, or am I just not getting hits, right? So, we can go ten at bats and hit the ball well almost every time and not get a hit, or you can really stink, and that's when you probably should do something a little different. But if you're having good at bats and you're hitting the ball hard, then there's really not much to change. But that's that that evaluating yourself and understanding what it takes to be successful in our game, because if you hit 300 for your career and you play a long time. You're a Hall of Famer. That's, three, you know, seven out of ten. You're not doing, you're not productive, supposedly. But I had a coach years ago that would talk about the process of, of evaluating each game. So if you had four quality at bats, they may not be four hits. It may even be a punch out late in the game against the closer and you had a 12 pitch at bat. That's a, that's a quality at bat against another guy that's really good. Right? Do you guys go through that part? I mean, because that's basically what you're saying, Nick, is, is you have to evaluate what you're doing, not just you get at three flares over the first baseman's head and go, I was four for four today, but you go, I yeah, better, great not day. Stick, better not stick with this for a long haul because it's not going to work out real well. But today it was okay. We've got to learn how to define success. And right. I think kind of what Nico, you know, was alluding to is just what, what actually – matters getting hits or you know is it swinging at the right pitches like you have to define your level of yep. success and sometimes better in a situation is instead of getting a hit maybe it's a sacrifice fly or you know and I know that counts as an 0 for 0 but 
Let's say you, you know you get a guy team. over. You get a guy over, yeah. right? So that's a quality back because you did what the si- the situation dictated. And there's so many different things that go into it other than just getting a hit because there are years too where you do get a little bit luckier than yeah. the previous year, and you know that that can kind of fluctuate, but. One thing that I was always told is batting averages go up and down, but RBIs always stack on top of each other. Um, they never go down. So uh, it's just all about perspective. Great answer. Go ahead. Yep. Fire away. My name is Declan, and I have two questions for you. The first is, what does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. 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 So, uh, we had a guy on our team last year, uh, Cody Bellinger. (laughs) And it was, uh, I want to say it was post All-Star break. And he He was hitting like 340. And it seemed like he was getting three or four hits a night. And... We'd ask him, what are you, what are you doing? Like, what do you, what's going on? And, uh... Or what do you got on this pitcher? And he's like, you know, he's, Cody, Cody's obsessed with his setup. He wants to feel really good in his stance and his setup. And he would say, you know, I'm kind of just, I, I want the ball, like, right here. And, I, and it's like, well, if that's where you want the ball, it should, we should all want the ball there because you're getting a hit every single time you're coming up. So that was just to remind everybody that it's like, when you get that pitch right here, that's, that's the one that you want to swing at. That's the one going on to Waveland Avenue. <laughs> Second question. Go ahead. And also, Dansby, could you sign my card? <laughs> yeah, come up here. We can do autographs after, so you know, not everybody comes up to the stage. Come on up. It'll be $5, right. though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got a two-part question as well. Uh, first one is uh, for the four of you guys up there. Uh, you go into a game plan for each series, right, for each pitcher that you're going to face. Do you have, it, if your game plan changes, if at all, when you're going up against the Logan Webbs, Spencer Striders, Corbin Burns, Zach Gallons of the world versus anybody else? Um, I, I don't think, like, the you're not going to take your approach much differently just because the guy's having success, but... I mean, the first three pitchers you mentioned, all their fastballs go different directions. So, like, those are that's like probably more so where you're going from. Like, Logan Webb, he's going to go like that, and Spencer Strider is going to go like that, and Corbin Burns is going to go like that. So, I mean, those are more like the first thing you're going to look at. The better a pitcher is, the more likely he wants to get ahead, and the more likely and the more strikes that he throws. And 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 if you wait around, like if you wait around for an ace. He's going to have 11 strikeouts in the seventh inning and have thrown 70 pitches. So there's no waiting those guys out. And um, you have to sort of match their aggressiveness because giving a guy like that one of your three strikes, that just gives them an opportunity to throw something really nasty. And it happened. Like, like we were kind of talking about it earlier, evaluating success. There are days in the big leagues where the, the pitcher was good. The pitcher was just better. Because, because every single one of us has holes, in, uh, not a hole, but, but, but a, a, uh, a weakness in their swing. And there's day, I, you don't get something to hit. It just didn't happen. You got diced. It just happened. So when you, the better the guy is, you have to understand that it's like we have to be aggressive early. And we don't want to let him get into a rhythm of just throwing strikes and seeing pitches because it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. I, one quick thing on that is you need to be able to honestly assess, are you going to be at an advantage, a disadvantage, or equal that day? And there's some days where you're at a disadvantage and you have to go in and understand how to take what they give you. And then there's days where you feel like you have the advantage. You may be able to be a little more selective, kind of get it where you want it. And then there's the days where you just feel like it's kind of an even matchup and you're looking for what you're looking for. Yeah, all those guys you mentioned, usually the top pitchers in the league come right at you. They're very rarely... You know, top pitchers walking a lot of guys and not having success. So we got to understand or be on top of our game plan and figure out what we're looking for. I mean, they're going to pitch me different than they're going to pitch Dansby or Nico or Talk. Um, so we got to really just focus on our game plan. And it's usually a group effort if we're going to take down one of those guys, you know. 
I might need to see more pitches than Dansby. Or if Talkman's aggressive, I got to work that bat. So, I mean, it's usually a team effort to take down usually a top pitcher in the league. And I think what Dansby was saying also, and I couldn't agree more, is that's winning baseball, right? You, you know if, if you're facing the Cy Young of the year before, you know, two runs might be the best you got. So everybody has to dig in and have a quality at bat, and that goes back to getting a guy over, getting a bunt down, hitting the ball the other way, a sacrifice fly. That's winning baseball come October, and that's what you're really talking about because that's when you're facing the best pitching. And that's what, you know, everybody up here, we, all you've heard is, you know, how are we going to be successful? And then it's the next thing is all about team, right, and being successful as a group because that's what, you know, this group is about. And, I, I, you know, since I've been coming back here, you know, to broadcast, it's been fun to watch this group year after year. And it, the faces have changed a little bit at times. But still, the Cubs are here to win now. Where that we can't always say that was the case years and years ago, right? And we all know that as Cub fans, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, but that's changed. Then I, oh, real, I just I had a fire away. Uh, yep. Sorry, yeah. Uh, going back to talk, uh, you've gotten this, I'm sure, all the time the last several months. But like, bottom of the ninth, St. Louis in July, <laughs> hostile environment, man. You've got Bird on the bump. Burleson hits that ball. What are you thinking at that time? Like, what's your mindset? And then knowing you robbed him. What's what's going through your head? I mean, this is the hitting talk, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of a big play, though, in the season. We have seen it on the uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, here we go. You made Pat and I sound really good that day, too, I think. <laughs> um, honestly, at that point, I'd already blacked out. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when, when you play outfield, you try to play it instinctively. And, um, you know, anytime you hit the warning track when you're tracking something, you have to immediately become aware of where the wall is. Uh, and, you know, I was just fortunate that uh, the ball st stayed in the glove. And, um, you know, that was... That was at a time where there was a lot of belief in the clubhouse that um, we could make a real run at, that, at, this, at this thing. And to kind of continue the win streak that we had going um, was just huge for the guys. And because we felt like we're like, we love this group. We want to add. We don't want to lose guys. We want to add. So, um, you know, just, just, just a good moment for the team. Yeah, I got a question for you. Great answer. I got a question for you guys. Is there a moment last season – for each one of you, hitting, since we're talking about hitting, that you had that at bat, that you still look back on and go, it, it, the feel good at bat that you had for the year. And it doesn't always have to be a big home run, but one of those at bats that you go, that was my AB. I had great at bat that day. Or, the, you know, what could have been a home run, right? Anybody? Any? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I had a, a tough, like, first half of July, kind of going into the All Star break, and then. You know, you kind of have a, a little break and self-evaluate a little bit and take some time off and then came back and still struggled a bit after the break. But then um, the Nationals series, um, I hit a grand slam that felt, mm -hmm. you know, obviously it was my first one and felt amazing. But um, it's cool when that's timed up also with, like, the trajectory of the team as well. And um, that was going into the break. Like, talk was talking about such a significant time of the year for us and, you know, I felt like I was able to be myself and help the group down the down that stretch of July, and um, yeah, that was significant yeah. for me. Guys, um, anybody? I think for me, uh, playing the White Sox, I had a pinch hit homer against. Them. I just wanted to beat them so bad. I, uh, so I, I was happy to contribute to the team, and we ended up winning that game on Morel's home run. And it was just so much fun that game. So I would say that was mine. Dinner tastes really good that night, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was good. <laughs> I guess for me, uh, <laughs> last year I was actually coming off the IL when I had hurt my foot. And coming back, it's so funny. Like, you sit there and watch the game, and the game's so easy when you watch it on TV. You're like, why, why aren't you swinging at that? Why are you swinging at that? And I literally just took that thought process. When I got back, I said, I'm just going to 
look in the spot I want to hit, and I'm going to swing at everything that's in my spot and make it as simple as it was. And it's funny how, like, everything else kind of lined up because yeah. of that. And so once I came off the I.L., uh, first pitch, I hadn't seen a live pitcher or nothing. First pitch back, I hit a double, and I was like, this is a great game. Yeah, I love this I'm game. Yeah, this, Easy game. Yeah, 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 yeah. this is awesome. <laughs> Question over here. Wave so we can see it. Okay. Hello. Hi. What's your name? Um, Ava and Mary. Hello. Um, and uh, what does it take to be... Um, uh, like, um, like, a um, a major leaguer? Yeah, major leaguer. <laughs> trying. <laughs> well, go ahead, major leaguers. Let's hear it. What does it take to be a major leaguer? Great question. Because if you could figure that out, everybody, there'd be a lot of them. And there's not a lot of them. I mean, there's a lot of different ways. <laughs> there's a lot of different right. guys. Stanford you, guy? Yeah, there we go. You got a lot of different guys you play with, and I think that's one of the cool things about our sport. There's a lot of different ways to get here from um, different parts of the world and um, different routes, and I think you know each of us have, have our own stories, but I think the, the common thing between all of us is like a, a pretty genuine passion for what we do, and uh, a lot of people that helped us when we were young, and that's a nice combination when it lines up like that. I think, I mean, sacrifice, like so much, I've sacrificed so much in my life um, from when I was a little kid to even now uh, that it really does take a lot of discipline and, you know, didn't go to a lot of events in high school, you know, wasn't necessarily the coolest kid in high school, but kind of knew what I wanted and went for it and, you know, kept that mentality ever since Um, I was a young kid that. I was going to give up certain things because this is the life that I wanted and was very fortunate that, you know, God blessed me in certain ways with talents and abilities and, you know, laid out my path for me. But, uh, you know, it goes along with what Nico said, but sacrifice and discipline for me was big. Well, the last question we were going to ask, and I think you just started it off very well, Dansby, your thoughts, right? The question was, what does it take to be a major leaguer? Let's take it into next season you guys thoughts on next season right? we've heard sacrifice what thoughts going into next season i'll give you the last uh, word well, on the end here yeah go ahead yeah you, yeah just going into next year yeah your thoughts going into next season and, and wrapping this up you know you've got cub fans the expectation you were this close to making the playoffs what are your guys thoughts going into next year? i mean we're we're excited you know The way it ended last year, I mean, we're so close, and we got a good group coming back. We're adding pieces here and there, and, uh, I mean, there's a lot of excitement in the clubhouse, you know, from you guys' fans. We feel it, and uh, we know the times now and just can't wait to get it going again. Yeah, I think it's a a nice combination of of, uh, having somewhat of a returning group. Um, but also some new additions, um, whether it's on the staff or uh, players that we've added or have yet to add. And so I think there's like a healthy sense of identity already, but then um, knowing that there's, there's more that we can do and figuring that out in spring as well. Yeah, I told you you get final word, right? I didn't want to stop. You, you want to go? You want to go? Yeah, man, yeah, I got some stuff. I, I got people talking in my ear. It's <laughs> no, no. not me. Don't worry. I hear you. I hear oh, you. you're going to have to wait a minute. Sorry, yeah. bro. I mean, <laughs> no, all I was going to say is just that um, – you know, I, I feel like in the second half of the year last year, the group really gelled, and, and I think that it's a, it was a lot of guys' first taste at what was yeah. essentially playoff baseball at the end of the year. And, like, you know, I've been fortunate to be on some good teams. I know Dansby has as well, been on some really, really good teams. The margin's so small. So, so it's just that extra little bit that, that that's what it takes. And, I mean, if you look at, like, you know, we were right there with the Dimebacks in the year. They made it to the World Series. Yep. So, so if you get in the dance, you got a chance. You never know. I didn't mean to make that rhyme, but yep. it did. I, uh, D? Before we get to next year, we got to re-sign Belly. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you to – listen up real quick. Thank you to all the Cub fans. Thank you. Great time at the Cubs convention. That's right.